All right, everyone, welcome back. So here we are, day two, week four of the class, and we're going to continue with our projects. Um, before all of this, though, I would start to get you used to doing a little bit of professional coding practices. We have this file, and you have, again, you're going to get lots of help on this stuff. I'm going to put my copy of the finished code on Canvas at the end of every class, so you have something to refer to that is often also gonna be useful for you when we do the next lecture. I'm just gonna be building upon my project. What I'm doing there very subtly is also doing backups. I finished my code for the day on Monday. I saved it, I saved it on Canvas. When I start today, I'm gonna to do a save as and change the name. So that's very subtle, but that's a little bit of backups. If today's code completely fails, if my app completely fails, and I don't have a backup, it's very hard to undo what I did. It can sometimes be better to start over than to try to fix what you have. And I don't mean start over from step zero. I mean, start over from the last backup. So right here from Canvas, we have a starting point that if today, by the end of the day, you completely mess it up, instead of taking a lot of time with myself or the assistants to figure out what you did, sometimes we will say, start over. Sometimes it's gonna be easier to start over than undo that Gordian knot and figure out what you did. So I'm always gonna put this sort of starting point on Canvas. What this means for you, I would recommend for your own projects to do a little bit of backups. And that is simply before you start doing new code for the day, do a save as. Save as will make a copy. You'll have your original before you made changes then you'll have a new file to make changes. If you completely make a mess of today's code, delete that file and open yesterday's file, save as again, and now you've got a new starting point before you made the changes that you cannot undo. Could also take it to the next level and those copies, those backups and such, save them to a USB drive, save them to Google Drive, uh, Microsoft OneDrive, because remember, the college gives you for free space on Google Drive and face on space on Outlook. You have cloud storage. You have a place to save your files if you lose your USB drive, if you forget to bring your work with you or take it home. You know, it's the first time that's happened to me in a while, but I taught a class yesterday. I forgot to upload my notes. I turned off the computer and later on when I remembered later to upload my notes, they were gone these computers reset, even my instructor computer. So because I didn't upload my notes from yesterday's class, I don't have the notes. They're gone. These computers reset. And you know, the notes are useful, but I recorded the video. That's no problem. So for all, for yourselves, if you're not making copies and backups and whatever of your code, you could make a big mistake and there's no way to undo it. You can only undo as the app is running, undo, and you have a hundred undos but when you close the app and start it again, it erases, it starts from scratch, the undo. So in my case, I've got a USB drive and in there I have the work from Monday, which I just opened on Animate and I'm gonna follow my own advice. I would, would like all of you as well, save as, and then give it a, a new date, a new number, a new version number, a new letter, however you wanna do this, right? I've got mine just set up with the dates and a letter there. so. If you want to, you can put letter B or, you know, today's date. But the first thing you want to do when you come to class, all of that is to say, when you come to class, save as, make a copy of your work so that you have a backup. And now if you see on my flash drive, well, I've got Monday's work as I finished it on Monday. And then today's work. And if I don't make any mistakes and such, okay, that'll be my next milestone for the next week. But if I make a bunch of mistakes and I can't fix them, okay, I can go back to the Monday work and start again. Yeah, it sucks to say sometimes, but sometimes starting over is the best answer. Not trying to figure out 50 steps that you did wrong, start over. And then when you start over, it makes more sense the second time. It's faster the second time. The second time that you work, it is also better because again, you absorb it more. You can practice it more. So starting over is not so bad. I made a copy here of my work 
and probably I it would behoove me to go to the Android settings just in case. Back to the Android settings and just make sure all of this looks normal. I might have to retype in my password there, but as we do the debug, you don't really need to set up the deployment, only if you really are plugging into a real device. But if we're doing debug on the simulator, you don't have to worry about the deployment tab. Just make sure everything else looks good. Output file name looks weird. I might change that. You might change that if you wish. It's optional. So at this point here, let's see. All right. So we've got title. Well, to remind yourself, to remind ourselves where we left off, I'm going to debug it. Get used to that as well. Let's see where's the project at so far. I'm also working on it on the side myself to enhance other concepts. Oh, that reminds me also, whatever we learned on Monday, I didn't say it, but now I'll say it. What we learned on Monday, you should have applied that to your own game by today. What we learned today on Wednesday, you should apply that to your game by next Monday. There's no homework, but you should be applying what we're learning here and not wait until the end. It'll add up to be way too much if you're waiting for assignments. You, again, you've got your version of the game that you turned in um, on yesterday. I haven't graded it yet. You've got your version of your project with your great ideas. And then we've got the version we're doing in class, The Haunted House. So what we're learning in The Haunted House, if you feel you understand it and you got it to work on The Haunted House classwork, you should apply that code to your own game, which will you will eventually turn in at the end of the semester. Let's see, what we did last time was we set ourselves up for help. Help screen later, go back. I'm seeing the feedback down there. Okay, the action script is ready. I click the button to go to help. So now I'm in the help screen. I click the button to go back to the title screen. So now I'm back. I click the button to start the game. We'll fix that button to make it a little nicer in a moment. Um, then uh, I'm going to the main screen one. I'm at the gate. There's a gate there, click on the gate. It animates to open up, pauses for a moment, then moves to the next scene. So what does it say here? Play the gate animation, and now I'm at the front door. So that's where we're at so far. So back on the title screen, we have a button for help and a button for start the game. In the library, we've got a symbol for help and a symbol for start the game and a symbol for the gate. The basic way to do things is you can have a symbol for every single thing. That works great. A little bit more professional, a little bit more advanced is to sort of group together things in a symbol. Instead of having seven buttons, and they all look similar, but maybe different colors, different text, instead of seven symbols, I can make one symbol. And in that one symbol, in the timeline, I have the seven views of the seven different buttons. We're going to do that. We're going to oftentimes do things in several ways. So instead of seven different buttons, this button that I called start game, I'm going to call, I'm going to rename it to generic button. And in that generic button, I can have five versions of it and then show the correct version when necessary on a screen. This is gonna be very advanced or very useful that is when we get more advanced, like say we've got characters, I could have, or the expressions, let's say, I've got those expressions of my characters from the model sheet assignment. Instead of having the seven expressions here, they can all be grouped together into one symbol and then show the correct frame of the symbol when necessary. So let's rename start game into button, generic button. And the name in the library can be anything. And then remember the name on the stage is its own thing. 
in the library. I'm going to rename that to generic button. <clears throat> I'm going to double click to edit it. Edit it, double click it in the library. And in my layers, I'm going to set this up. Uh, background, text, code. There's a layer that is going to be about the background of the uh, of the button. It might be the colors, drop shadows, whatever. There's a layer where I will have all of the text of the button and then a layer for code. So on this one, this was our start the game. So on my text layer, uh, I can just, I can use the text tool or write it. I'll just use the brush. Obviously, when you make a change to something in the library, it then changes everywhere that you use it in the project. So <clears throat> that's frame one. Frame two, right click, insert keyframe that copies my drawing of the background layer onto the second frame. I'll make a little change to it, like change the color of the button, let's say. So I'm gonna have a button that's got a blue background, a button that's got a red background. On the text layer, I'll, I'll write another text. So right click, um, insert blank keyframe so I can draw a new text. Let's say this one's exit. Making one generic symbol where I can have all 20 of my buttons on their own frame, frame one, frame two, frame 20. Instead of making 20 separate symbols, they're all on one symbol with their own frame. Might be seeing where we're going here because if I then test my project, okay, the button is just gonna blink through all frames. We know how to deal with that. That's what we did with the gate. Right, the gate was animated, so we add a stop command on the first frame of my generic button, and then the button won't go crazy. Okay, we learned that last time, and that makes sense, right? That if you've got a bunch of frames, going to play automatically unless you add code to stop blank keyframe so that I can stop on frame two. This is also known sometimes as a uh, as a sprite sheet. I believe, sprite sheet or sprite model sheet, no, sprite sheet, where you've got one symbol that holds the various expressions of your character, the different poses of your character in a bunch of different frames. Then via the code, we can have it show which particular frame we need. Right now, automatically, of course, it's showing frame one, and I've told it to stop on frame one. And so when my project runs, I see start. Now, just to show you here, what if I wanted to show frame two? I want that to be my exit button. It doesn't make sense, but let's say I want that to be my exit button. Okay, how would I do that? In the code of my regular title screen here, where I've got all of this code at this point, this button at the moment in my case is called button game start. So if I say, then the instance name dot go to and play frame two button on the screen has 10 frames. 
go to the second frame. Go to and play. There's also go to and stop. But we've got go to and play. And then what that does is as soon as the app loads, it runs the code and it says, okay, here's my button. Even though the button has multiple frames, I told it to go to a specific frame, specific frame, show a specific frame. This is an advanced technique where it's a little smarter instead of making 20 buttons, put all the buttons on one button, put all the 20 buttons on their own frame. And then via the code, we can say, show me a button. Now, we're telling it to play, but then on that, but then on that frame, we've got to stop. That's why it stops there. But slightly more efficient, go to and stop. Same result. If we have a go to and play and a go to and stop, jump to that frame and stop there. Go to and play, jump to that frame and keep playing unless there's a stop. So here's a stop and a stop, double stop. If I had a fourth button that is, you know, open map, and that was on my fourth frame, I have designed a button on the fourth frame. It's very poorly. But if I've got a fourth frame and I tell my code, show the map button, yeah, it does what I tell it. The code is saying, on that instance of that thing on the stage, based on the instance name, go to some frame in its timeline, in this case, four, and show that frame. I didn't program the stop there, but go to and stop does it for me, right? My uh, generic button only has stop on frame one, stop on frame two. I forgot to put stop on frame three or four, but the code go and stop helps me with that. That'll be useful later once we start, you know, again, as I said, we're going to do the gene uh, we're going to do the basic um, gameplay. We're not worried too much about the fancy stuff. We want the basic gameplay. Then we can go back and do the fancy stuff because I want to add, okay, uh, multiple characters. I want to add uh, maybe branching paths. I want to add ex experience points. We have lots of ideas that we could do depending on our time and what people want us to do, we, we could do them, but we've got to get the basic navigation and the basic gameplay and the music and stuff like that. And then we can add the icing on the cake. Maybe let's do this. Um, in the chat, if you want, in my file, I'm going to add here as a comment. You don't have to do this, but I will do it on my file. Uh, I'm going to say um, to do requested features. Um, Tell me in the chat if you, if you what do you want extra for this game to do uh, besides what we know it's going to do. We're going to move to different screens. We're going to pick up objects. We're going to have time limits. We're going to have a little bit of randomicity here and there. What else do you want this game to do? I know what I want it to do is uh, character select. That's not on the agenda yet, but I know I want to do that. All want to do put it in the chat there or yes. Okay, put that in the features there. So on screen, WASD movement. Cool. Let's see what else here. Mini boss. Um, okay. Let's see about mini boss. What more about the mini boss? Um, like what else about it? Maybe that it is. Um, I don't know. But okay, we'll put mini boss in there. And we'll think of more ideas there. Yeah, if any of you for the moment put it in the chat, I'm going to move on here. But here's some possible things that we can do after we get the basics of it working. Um, people often ask also inventory system 
you know, collect these three things before you can move to the next area. So lots of things we can do. Some are easier than others, but I'll put them in here uh, to keep in mind to do them eventually. And depending how, uh, how, how much time we have that we get the basics done, then we can add the icing on the cake. Okay, so what's next here is that after we start the game, we go to the gate screen. There's a basic interactivity here. Open that door. Little by little, we're teaching the people how to use our own game. Also, what I want to add here, I know we're going to do this sooner than later, but let me add it here also. I want to add, um, call it as a um, cut scene. We'll have to call it character. Character cut scene for plot. I want our characters that we drew back on assignment one, I want them to appear on screen for a moment and then say stuff, a plot point or whatever, maybe a little hint on how you interact on that screen. Um, and then the scene starts to interact because right here we're programming it and we know that you tap on the door to go in, that's it. But we could have our character appear and then say, okay, I guess we're going to try to get in. Let's try to the front door. Um, I better not try to climb those spikes. You might then program a secret passageway through the spikes. Because then when we get into the front door, okay, we got to draw front door and stuff. And here we're going to have three interactive elements. We're going to have two that don't work and one that does. So again, we're going to add more complexity as the game goes on. That ends on this screen, the front door of the haunted house. So in this front door layer, I'm gonna draw the basic aspects of the haunted house. And in my example game that I showed previously, we're gonna have that the front door, we can try the front door, but it won't work. It'll just rattle, it won't work. We're gonna have a tree that we might think, oh, let's climb the tree to get to the second level. We try to climb the tree, it breaks, so it doesn't work. Then there's gonna be a window. The window is the way to get in, but not by just trying to open the window. No, we're going to pick up a rock and break the window to get in. So taking things to the next level, picking things up to interact with, pick up this rock to break this window, or pick up this key to unlock that door. So I'm going to draw here the front. You draw the, the front of, a, of the scary house on its own layer. In a moment, we will draw the front door, the tree, and the rock. But on the background, scary house. Uh, we can make it amazing later, but just some starting point. Actually, wait. Uh, not the front door. The front door will be an interactive element. I will put it on its own layer. The window will be an interactive element. We'll put it on its own layer. The tree will be its own interactive element. Put it on its own layer. So super simple for the moment. Background that is not interactive. And then a new layer, which I will call interactive. On that layer, I will draw front door. We'll draw a window. a tree. Interactive elements on their own layer. Background on its own layer. I'll put all the polish about uh, the moon and stuff later and birds flying later. And then we'll do the part of the cut scene where our character appears saying, hey, this, this is the front door. Let's try the front door. Um, and, oh, maybe that tree will help me climb to the roof. You know, we'll have the character do plot stuff. So like something like that, that that tree, I climb the tree, I can get to the second floor. And this door, do. moment to create something like that. 
Again, we're doing a project together, the haunted house. Yours is not a haunted house, probably. But what we're going to learn right now, today, it's about creating interactive elements that are a dead end and then creating hit detection. Make this touch that. Those ingredients, you figure out how you want to add them to your game. The code will be the same. It'll be your visuals that will change. So on this particular scene, this particular scene, these interactive elements, We need to turn them into symbols. And again, uh, only where there is actual color is it clickable. If at the moment I only make the door frame, a person will have to tap exactly on the line. If they tap here, there's nothing there, so it's not tappable. And just as a starting point of things, it's in with basic color just so that they are actually interactive symbols, which means I'll be able to edit them as much as I want later. So the door. Or right click, convert to symbol. This is a sprite. So I want to call this SP for Sprite, whatever you want. Front door, flip, rotation from the center. Window, I click convert to symbol. P, it's a sprite, um, front window, and then the tree, or to symbol, SP front um, tree. Each one of these is now a symbol. See in your library there. I named them that way because notice how they're grouped together. Alphabetically, front door stuff. I mean, uh, you know, front, front of the house stuff. The front door, the front tree, the front window. If I was dealing with, let's say, um, warehouse hallway, and I have a bunch of interactive boxes, I could call them all SP hallway box one, SP hallway, or SP hallway box two, um, SP hallway um, toolbox, right? Just by giving them this sort of names like this, they're grouped together alphabetically within your library, so you can find them easily. This by itself that I called gate could be named a little better because I can't, at a glance, I cannot at a glance tell where I'm using it. All of these that I named them this way, oh, I'm using them on the front door, the front of the house. Um, I may, I may use this gate in several places in my game. That's fine. I'm just saying, consider what you call these things uh, when you've got a lot of them to work with. And you will as you progress with your project. If these needs an instance name, so select the symbols that you just created. And then under the properties, we'll give these some names. Simplify these, calling them without the SP part, uh, front door. So when you've got the door selected under object here, call this front door. Don't forget to press enter. You call it the same as the symbol, but it is sometimes useful to give them different names so that in the code, you can tell them apart. Um, SP here is for me to remind me that it's the actual object in the library. And then front door here is the, is the name for when I write the code. 
window, same thing, just call it front window. I just want to call it front win. If you don't want to spell it all out and such, call them as you wish. Remember to press enter. Three, front tree. Something you're going to do over and over and on your own game. Some layer that is not interactive. Some layer for interactivity. It can be called whatever you want, of course. You can put all the interactive elements on one layer or each one on its own layer if you also want. But here I'm separating those that interact and not. The interactive elements have all been turned into symbols. And very important, they all have an instance name so that the code knows what to do. So that the code basically is connected with that object. So for the door, just like on the previous screen, the person thought, okay, I'll just go to the door and open it. This will be a dead end. They'll try to open the door and it'll wiggle and not open. Maybe we'll put a sound effect too of like a scary creature growling when we get to sound later. But this door will kind of look like it's trying to open and it'll never open. When they try to climb the tree, the tree will fall over going to go through the window. We also need here then, almost forgot, we need here then the rock or the tree branch or the lead pipe or whatever that we're going to interact with. So one more thing, uh, we're going to draw a rock or a, a, a branch or, you know, we get really advanced. Let's break the tree to get the branch to open the window. Okay, that's a little too advanced for the moment. Uh, we'll just say, We'll have a separate interactive element here, a rock. I will then convert to a symbol. That one, SP front rock. An instance name, front rock. That. that will do our hit detection. Pick this thing up to touch it against the window, to break the window, to then be able to walk into the the house. The front door is not going to work. The tree is not going to work. So dead end interactivity. Do the dead end. We'll do the dead end interactivity of the front door first. Code so far in the front door scene. We've got our stop, we've got our trace. And we're gonna do what we well, did previously. We can grab it back from frame one, back on frame one where we can copy and paste about, there's some interactivity that's going to happen defined by a function. Not actually moving to any scene yet. This listener and this function. Here's an advanced thing. If I know I'm going to use those two lines over and over, uh, what if I have a copy of them right next to each other? So I don't have to go back and forth copying two separate lines. I know I'm gonna do those two things over and over. I've got my explanations, which are nice but it's cumbersome to copy one piece, paste it, copy another piece, paste it. Okay, pro tip, put them together, copy them both at the same time. You're gonna do those things over and over. Here. One copy and paste instead of four. I know that my front door instance name is that. The front door is about to become interactive. Fn, because it's a function, it's a group of code. Front door animation. Definition of that is explained on the next line. 
there. It's based on a touch event, et cetera, et cetera. That's why we did the copy and paste. Our various steps here, break that to the next line. I will comment myself here to remind me that's the end of things. I will add a trace to remind me that is running. Next dead end will be that you tap on the door, it will never open, it will never take you to the next scene, but it's gonna wiggle. Uh, it's going to play a sound. It's going to do whatever. Um, that means that based on the symbol, the next part happens here. This front door will play its timeline. A little bit of animation in the door. But at the moment, we've got to stop have a stop on the door, but we don't have any animation in the timeline of the door. We just have a drawing of a door. We're going to make an animation, five, six frames, three frames, whatever, of the door wiggling and rattling around. And so now we've set it up. Someone tries to open the door, play the animation of the door, nothing else will happen. So the door needs a little animation for, for this to play. Jump back to the library, my front door, make some animation here. Super simple. I'm going to right click, insert keyframe or F6. I'm just going to kind of go door this way, F6, wiggle it this way. Seven. I could do so many things here. Um, I'm just creating, you know, little wiggle animation. I'm trying to rattle the door. I could fix this animation completely later. But the point is, I'm trying to set up an animation in the symbol so that when the when we get to that part, the um, and I try to tap the door, it's just going to wiggle. I wanted to do a quick test and I'm getting an error here. So that's good. So I can see what happened here. Call to possibly undefined play to a reference of static type function. What's that? So if I double click that, I'm trying to play the, oh, that's it. Uh, okay, that's that makes sense. Uh, I'm trying to play the timeline of the door. The door is referenced by this. Pasted the wrong thing. This is saying there's a door, play that code. And then I paste it here without thinking. I meant that door play its animation. That instance of the door in my library, play its animation. That's what I meant. Sorry. Not the, here's the code I'm running, play it. It's not exactly right. Should fix that error. I'll get back to this code in a moment. The point is, is that Obviously, when there's animation in a, and I got to put that back to frame one, obviously I'm not exiting, but I have to put that back to frame one. But when I start the game and I open the door and I get to this screen, well, of course, it's going to be wiggling nonstop. That's the nature of a movie clip. Movie clip plays on its own unless we have a stop. I don't want that to start to wiggle until I tap it. So the timeline of my front door has an animation that I don't want to play. So that needs a stop on the first frame. On that, it should not be wiggling until I interact. Then it wiggles. Animates, that is.
front door. That door has an instance name, of course. Code there is saying that is interactive. Once we tap it, run some code, the code is give ourselves a message, play the timeline. We'll do here to do later, play also a sound, maybe a growling creature or something. When we learn sound, we'll do that later. This is another useful use for the notes to give yourself reminders of what you need to do later. And then so what this play is doing here, play the timeline of the uh, symbol. It's animation. That assumes that that symbol has frames of animation. Which it does, which is what I did a, a moment. A moment to go there. I just went in there and just made five frames of animation. I just moved the thing. Maybe even, you know, redraw it manually. Maybe it pop out of its frame. Whatever. Just all of this. So five frames of animation happens kind of fast. Remember, you can have two frames at a time. That'll slow down your animation a little. If you have one frame at a time, it's very fast. Two frames at a time, it's a little slower. Three frames at a time, even slower. Front door, interact, wiggles, and that's it. Very cartoony, jumping out of its frame and everything. See that illusion of animation? It's just, it's just six, it's just five frames of slightly changing the drawing. It's animated. It's, it's, it's got life now. Pause there. So that makes sense. Again, these lectures, they're all being recorded. I'm going to put my example code. If it feels I'm a little fast, of course, I'll stop for. We've got a wasp in the, in the room right there. It looks scary. Oh. Um, deal with it in a moment. But um, the uh, lecture might seem a little fast. It's all being recorded. We're stopping for help here and there. We are... Um, Going to put the recording and everything so if it feels too fast it's up to you to replay the video and ask for help does that make sense where we're at we wouldn't miss anything here right as for this wasp in the room i don't know i don't want to kill it but it should be in here and i don't think we'll be able to take it out of the room let's volunteer to help me kill it Just hit it with my chair and that's it. Is it poisonous or not? Because ne we're never going to get it out the door over there if it's on the other side over here. So it's a sensitive. I have to kill it. But uh... it's cold over here. Hopefully there's not a whole nest of them on the other side of the ceiling, but. Uh, oh. Step outside if you want, that's it. Which is more hollow than I thought. But there it is on the window. Slim would not 
do love animals and such, but this is just not gonna not gonna be able to progress if we don't deal with this. So sorry about that. <laughs> It's kind of hard to get to now. Yes. <laughs> So let's go on. Maybe that'll give you an idea for one of the levels of the game. Okay, so at this point, that is a dead end interactive element. Let's do the other one, then we'll take a break. The um, the tree, the tree is going to be very similar where there is this tree. I want to climb the tree and the branch will break. So this... Um, this tree is very similar. Instance name, event listener, play some code, play the timeline of the tree. What's going to be different here is, well, if the tree breaks, I, I shouldn't even try to climb it anymore. This door, you can keep trying to open it as much as you want. But this tree, once it breaks, don't try to interact with it anymore. We know about adding an event listener so that something is always interactive. Add event listener has an opposite. Remove event listener. Stop paying attention to this thing. So the tree is going to be interactive only until the first time you try to interact. Can we set it up that after we try to climb it three times? Yes, of course, we can do anything for the moment. When we try to interact with the tree one time, it'll break right away, and then it's no longer interactive. So we need, again, this group of code, the listener and the definition of the function. It's still in memory, I believe. No. So I can go back again to my title scene, and I can grab my chunk of code here that I'm going to use over and over. This is useful that when you select something of code on one scene, it stays selected until you deselect it. So I can just quickly copy it from back on scene one, paste it into my new scene here and make the changes to it. Changes are that I've got front tree. It's the interactive thing. The function here would be function of front tree animation. Definition of that is here. As usual, break this down this way. And over and over. It's the same sort of idea that this tree has its own little timeline. That we're going to animate the tree breaking. And then when the tree finishes breaking, it'll have code so that it's no longer interactive. Similar to the gate, when the gate animated open, eventually it had code to then take us to the next screen. So we're going to have code on that tree that after it animates breaking, just like the gate, after it animates breaking, there'll be a little pause, maybe. And then final frame of the tree is that remove, remove event listener. No longer let itself be interactive. It'll be interactive one time. 
then you try to climb it, it breaks, and then it's not interactive anymore. So front door, front tree. See how we're doing several things over and over. Couple of the nuances change, but the main structure of your code you will often do over and over, changing little things. Okay, so the tree, that needs its own animation in its own timeline. That's of course why we also use um, symbols because um, they, they have their own little world of a timeline and frames and um, code if we need it. So I'll edit the tree. I'm going to animate tree. Let's see. I'll, I'll skip two frames over, press F6. Then I'm going to... Um, I'm going to with the lasso tool, I could, you know, you could redraw it, but what I'm going to do here in my case, I'm going to select a piece of the tree, kind of make it pop out over here, tilt it a little, so the tree's going to pop out, then jump two more frames, F6, that piece here. some more, rotate at some amount. Two more frames, jump over F6. I'm using the lasso tool here to be able to make a selection around three. Um, just over here, rotate it some more, this far maybe. Is the tree starting to fall over? F6. Skip two frames, F6, further somewhere. Change it somehow. I redefine animation. In all the extra stuff, swooping lines, uh, leaves rustling. I could do so much. This is enough for me to get the idea that, yeah, the tree broke. I want it to have a sound effect of the uh, wood cracking. We'll learn sound later. If we want to have the sound of it hitting the floor, we'll learn sound later. So much we can do, but here we go. Okay, I broke a tree. I could go in and fix all the little details. Like, okay, I got to fix those lines there. Yes, we'll do that later. Uh, this is the great thing about working with symbols that it's its own self-contained world and then you have all of this you have all of this that um you can further edit in the future obviously now that there's an animation in this symbol if i go to this scene the tree is going to be breaking by itself over and over and over oh we learned what to do with the door stop command on frame one of the tree. So the repetitive things that on the one hand, it's repetitive, but on the other, okay, I, I think I get it. I, I think I see that uh, computers are dumb and repetitive and mechanical. And if I can think a little bit like mechanically and logically and such like a computer, I might do well. See here now, if I go back to that scene, it should not be animating until I interact with it. I interact with it and it regenerates. Okay, so what happened here? A timeline will play until the end and then it loops back by default. Well, I seem to need a stop at the end of the animation, right? Because it gets to my final frame, loops back to the beginning where there's a stop. And then when I tap the tree again, it does a front tree play, it plays, but then it comes back. So I need a stop at the end of the animation. Final frame, insert blank keyframe, F7, and then stop. 
stop on the first frame, stop on the last frame. The logical right. Start the game, go past the front door, try to climb the tree, breaks, stops. Perfect. Tap the tree. Whoops. This is what I'm saying about the logic and so forth. This is fine that I try to open the door 50 times. Can I set a number of limits before it stops? Yes, of course. Do that later. But on this one, every time I interact with it, the tree regenerates and falls again. Maybe I want that. Probably not. So there might be some elements that I want interactive and no more. Okay, a little more code to fix that. If we have an add event listener to pay attention to interactivity, of course, we have the opposite. It's like we have stop and play, go to and stop, go to and play. We have a lot of opposites in codes sometimes. We've got an add event listener, but we've got a stop event listener. Listen for interactivity and stop listening for interactivity. The code will be slightly different than when we saw before. I'll explain why in a moment. But when we are on that uh, front door, we simply have, okay, there's an interactive element. Listen for something. I know what we're about to do here. I'm going to do a little copy and paste here. Um, actually, I'm going to do a copy and paste here and then make a change. Um, this part is the part that activates the tree is clickable. We're going to change it a little bit to remove it. Uh, I'm going to copy it, that is. I'm going to copy it out of the front door, copy it, and I'm going to paste it into the tree symbol and change it a, a little bit. So that line 12 in my case where I'm listening for the interactivity on the tree, I'm going to copy that line. Remember here on this navigator on the left, that could be very useful where you can jump to the various um, frames of code. Now the tree has code on frame one and frame 10 or your final frame, whatever it is. So after your tree animates, we have stop so that it doesn't animate on its own on frame one. In my case, I've got stop on frame 10 after it breaks. And on that final frame, whatever yours may be, mine is frame 10, I'm gonna paste what I had back on the, what I had back on the, um, but I need to make a little change here. Uh, the code back on the main timeline worked because in the front door scene, all of this code is referring to code, uh, is referring to elements that are right here. When you're in a symbol, you're kind of in a deeper level. When you're in the tree symbol, it only sees what's inside of itself. And what I need to see is what's outside of itself, the main timeline. So we need to make a little change inside of the tree code right here. Frame 10. Flip, capital M, capital C, dot, or uh, parentheses, this dot root, and then dot front tree. Okay, that looks familiar. Movie clip, this root, dot, go to and play, scene help. Hey, that was something we saw previously when we made our, our buttons move us from screen to screen. When, we, when I want to go to help, movie clip, this root, play the main timeline into my scene, help. Inside of the tree, similar, in the main timeline, in the main timeline, so you might think about that as a note to yourself, that that means the main timeline. Not the timeline in the symbol, but the main timeline. We're saying in the main timeline, that's where my front tree is, and that's where I want to remove event listener. I'm going to write it in capitals, which is wrong, but I want to show you that change that from add to remove, lowercase, 
But I just want to show you that we're going to replace the add event to listener into remove. Then it becomes blue. This is all happening inside the tree on its final frame. We've stopped the animation of the tree. We've said back on the main timeline, that tree is no longer interactive. Furthermore, the command, actually, let me just double check something on my notes here. I have the one more thing here. Let me just check one thing. Is this uh, something we can do here so that it is even less effort? Just one moment. And my notes here, but sometimes I improve my notes. Let me just check that. Start the game, go there, break the tree, it stops, then we get an error. Okay, that's fine. So it is what I thought in my notes. I should listen to myself. Um, So this now has the same part of movie clip this route. There. One more change to that. Let me zoom out just so you can see it and then I'll zoom in so you can read it. Um, it's a long line. I'll zoom in in a moment. So we're saying on the main timeline, there is a tree, no longer pay attention to it. Or pay attention and no longer run the run the function on the main timeline. On the main timeline dot from that works. I'll zoom in for you to see it. But that should then turn off the should turn off the interactivity after the tree breaks. broken, no errors, tap the tree, no more interactivity. Now, how can I add that to my game? I'm trying to do something and then it, I try to do it and it, then it, I can no longer do it. <clears throat> Later, we'll learn about try to do it three times and then on the fourth time, it no longer works. We'll learn that later. We're building upon things in all of these weeks. So I'm giving you all these ingredients. It's then up to you to add them to your project. This door's still interactive as much as I want. Doesn't make sense for that tree to be interactive after I've broken it. So is there something in your game that you can do that one time and then it's broken? And this is the ingredient for that. You have on the final frame of your interactive element, in the final frame, you have now the ingredient to turn off interactivity. Let me break this into multiple lines so you can read it. Um, but from here to here, there's a comma. I'm going to press enter right there. Zoom in. A little bit of space if you want. Uh, careful here. Technically, this is all one long line because it's so long. I'm going to break it to two lines. But notice that I, I broke it. I pressed enter after the comma. If you do it in the wrong place, you know, if you try to break it here, that's going to cause problems. So I've broken the line right there after the comma. This line here is a continuation of the previous line. And you saw that all of that was a copy and paste from the plain old, it's an interactive element. I copied that line and then I did the change of on the main timeline, there is an interactive element Remove event listener. Don't forget that. Remove event listener. And on the main timeline, no longer pay attention to that function. Say so here, turns off the listener so it no longer runs the function. Three is no longer interactive. That's your ingredient to turn off interactivity of an element. So here, note, it's remove event listener. As you start to look at so much code and it all fills your head and your dreams and your eyes, you're going to gloss over things here and there. It's very easy to ignore that 
I didn't, you didn't change the add to remove that looks correct on first glance. You run your code, it doesn't work. And that's not going to cause an error. That is correct code, but this takes us to the two types of errors, syntax errors, logic errors. Syntax error is that I misspelled the word add. Of course that's wrong. There's no such thing as add. Did, did, did. But add event listener is valid code. There's no syntax error here. There's a logic error here. Logically, I don't want it to keep listening. I want it to remove the listener, stop listening. No listener and not add event listener. This is a logic error, not a syntax error. Get no feedback. I run that. So before I run that, let me put that back to the original design. I keep forgetting to do that. So that was simply back on that frame one. No longer have this here. Oh, we should make a note there. Um, from a generic button symbol with many frames, each frame is a different design. Uh, currently visible design, frame one. Design on another frame. by putting it as a comment, but keep it as the one that I want there of frame one. Gradient of, I've got a sprite sheet. I've got a symbol with 20 designs. I wanna show a certain design. Just say, yeah, go to that frame and stop on that frame. Have to memorize your frames a bit. So there is a way to refer to a frame by a name. We'll do that later. But here, very simply, jump to my frame two to display my exit button. Frame one is my start the game. Frame two is my exit the game. Frame three is load the map. Uh, frame three is nothing, actually. Frame four is load the map. Frame five is whatever. So I tell it what frame to go to easily. I'll put that back to normal so that I doesn't look weird that I'm about to exit the game. Maybe in the help, maybe if I after I read... After I read the help stuff here, maybe I have a have an exit. Oh, I remember. So that's that start is on the side. Okay, yes, actually we should fix that too. Um, yeah, we should fix that because. So here's why you should test your game because then you, you should test parts of the game that you already know that you worked on because then you'll realize you might miss things. One more thing than the break. Uh, this help right here. I use the generic button. But on frame one, it's the start. I want to go back. So in my case, generic button. Okay, frame perfect. Frame three will be back to go back. Frame one is start the game. Frame two is exit the game. Frame three is go back. Or is open the map. So logically, if I'm on the help screen, and that shouldn't show the back, shouldn't show the start. Um, start frame, then the code in help should be the name of my symbol in this scene, which is button go back. But that should be go to and stop. In my case, frame three is where I drew the back. If 
I go to help, that's back. Still works as before. It's going to say was I could have my exit the the exit the game button here showing frame um two. Start basic interactivity, click on one thing, go to the next scene. Interactivity here, two dead ends, front door, interacts forever, goes nowhere. Tree interacts one time, no more interactivity. After the break, I want to pick up that rock and throw it at that window. Hit detection. So let's take a break here. It's of code. And then, of course, I'm uploading it to Canvas for you to compare. But before we take the end of the break here, um, any request on what screen to leave it on before I take a break? Yeah. That is the remove activity right there. All right, it's one twenty. We'll take a ten minute break. We'll be back at one thirty.
right then let's go on so the uh next ingredient to learn here is to pick up this rock and throw it at that window which is hit detection both of those symbols will need um instance names both of them will need code and code that we will learn is about being a to click and drag an object. Right now, we learn about tapping an object and something happens. Now it's about tap and hold. Remember, these are ultimately going on mobile devices. We're used to right now working with a mouse and such, but eventually these are going to mobile. And on mobile, we also have the ability to do the double tap if we want and then the pinch and zoom and all of that. But what I wanna do is tap the object and move it somewhere on the screen. We can simulate that fine on the simulator. So I want to pick up the rock and move it onto the onto the window. And if the code detects this object is touching that object, there is a hit. Then we're going to do something we've already done twice, play the timeline of the window breaking. And when it gets to the end of the window break, move us to the next scene. Okay, so you should see that we're building upon things little by little. We have a tap, move to a new place. We have a tap, play an animation, then move us to a new scene. Here we have touch two objects, play the animation, then move us to a new scene. So the code in my front door, we need to first do, um, just like back on the title scene, we one of the very first things we did was we set up um, this multi-touch input there's also uh, sort of a kind of a setup like this to activate more features. Uh, one of them is to create boundaries where we can move an element. So in the uh, front door here, um, so far we've been writing all our code in order and it's worked fine. Uh, technically code also matters the order that you write it sometimes. You know, you can't play something unless something else happens sometimes. Sometimes the order of the code happens. I believe at the moment what we're about to write here, we could write it at the end, but it would be better that we actually set it up as one of the first codes up here. Um, I would write it down here just because of the logic of it we've been learning so far, but it would be better at the top here. I, Maybe I should have said it also earlier, but we're going to back up after our stop, after our trace. Let's add a new item before. Here with a note, set up the ability to create boundaries. Scene. I want to move this rock around anywhere within my screen, of course. I can accidentally move it off of the screen and then I can never get it. I can accidentally move something. It's a lot easier in the simulator because on your simulator, you can move your mouse beyond the screen and it's a lot harder on a real device, but we should still set up boundaries about where we can move this object. Now, it could be, of course, all over the screen or it could be like, imagine that there was a, you know, imagine that there was a little area within right here. I, I want to move something only within this area here. I want to be able to move this rock anywhere within the whole screen. But if I wanted to set this object can only move within these boundaries, that's what we're setting up here with that, with this code that we're about to write to set up boundaries. Code is it looks a little different than others we've done. Import, turn purple, import flash dot geom, as in geometry, dot rectangle with a capital R, and then semicolon, end of command. And one more, import flash uh, events dot touch event for myself to do something. This is for me. You can ignore that. 
but I need to check something. I'm always looking at uh, ways to improve the code semester after semester to make it more sense to teach it. I might have to check something there. So set up the ability to create boundaries in a scene. Um, the exact details, what does this mean? Don't worry about it. But this has to be typed this way with this spelling, etc. And now I can create rectangles, visible or invisible rectangles. And that's what I want to do in a moment. Create an invisible rectangle so that I can move the rock and not accidentally go outside of my game. Or if I wanted a very specific area, move this rock within this area. So creating rectangles. We'll move to the bottom of the code and continue our code. Need this at the top here because the order of the code matters. So I kind of want to say, let us have the ability to create rectangles and then later let's make a rectangle. So let's make a rectangle. Let's make a rectangle boundary for moving the rock. Just on that. There's a new code. This will be much more useful later. Like let's say when we add the part about hit points or health or various other things, we're gonna be working with something called a variable. A variable is a container in memory. In memory, I will store my sword. In memory, I will store my name of my character. I will store the hit points. A variable, V-A-R, is a way to create a virtual memory location, V-A-R. So create a variable, a memory location, stores the edges of the boundary. Later on, we'll use that var or variable to create to save the character's name, their hit points, etc. We'll call this rock boundaries. It's a data type. It's what kind of data to store. So later, don't do this yet, but we can have colon string. A string is another way to uh, mean like text. So the name of the character, string. We can have it display a, store a number, you know, my hit points. We have other ones, an array. It's a collection of data. We'll get to these other ones. Uh, for the moment, the one that we need here is rectangle. This variable, this container will hold rectangle rect, rectangle data. So we have string, that's text, number, that's numbers, of array, that's more complex data. Rectangle is coordinates of a rectangle, length and width and such. Two new. This is for later, but if I had var my character, colon, string, equal to quotes, Victor. Okay, I am creating there a memory location called my character. The data to be found in that variable is string, which is words. So the word equal, I'm filling that memory location with the word Victor. This is all for later. I'm gonna create a variable, a memory location called my experience points, which will be numbers. And that will be filled with, I have, you know, 99 experience. Array is too complex for the moment, but here's some examples so far how we will be working with more complex things later. Um, keep track of my character's name. It's a variable. Keep track of my character's experience. It's a variable. 
the type of data is a number, the type of data is a string, and we fill that memory location with equals, and then we put the data. A rectangle is a little bit more complex than you think. And so we're saying this memory location is called something, and it's going to be full of rectangle data, and is going to equal to a new rectangle. Why is that not like the other ones? I guess slightly more complex, but setting it up like this. The built-in command called rectangle. So we're going to create a rectangle in memory, the boundaries of where we can move the rock. Within the rectangle command here, we then have to say, okay, where does the rectangle start? Where does it end? How big is it? Stuff like that. Um, so if we wanted to say, um, you know, make a rectangle that is, uh, you know, right here, the, 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 box, the rock can only move inside of this rectangle. You know, I can only move it around in here. I need to know the X and Y coordinates of this rectangle here. My rectangle is going to be the whole, the whole stage. I want it to be able to move everywhere. So I need to know the coordinates of my whole stage. Uh, the very top left corner is zero, zero right here. All the way to the right in my case is 480, right? Because, or 800 because the size of our document is 800. And then all the way down here is 480. So making a rectangle starting from the top left corner, going all the way to the right, all the way to the bottom, in between will be a rectangle where the box can move. Now, my, my project here happens to be these dimensions, but the cool thing about Animate is that it can grow and shrink depending on the size of the device. If I'm on a smaller device, the stage will automatically shrink itself for a smaller device. If I'm on a bigger device, the stage will automatically grow. So if I tell it exactly 800 by 480, it'll be stuck on a certain size. Well, the code is smart enough in that we can write the code that it will detect how big the screen is. And that's what we're setting up here within the code. We're painting a rectangle. We're starting it at zero comma zero. Start on the very top left corner of my project. And then whatever the width of the game is and whatever the width of the height is, automatically fill it in. We do that with comma dot stage dot stage width. Capital W, it's width, like, you know, width and height, not go with me, but it's width and height. And then comma stage dot stage height. Start to make a rectangle from the top left corner, X and Y from the top left corner. And then go all the way to the right side of the stage, go all the way to the bottom of the stage. That is going to make a rectangle boundary starting from the top over here. If I wanted the rectangle to start from over here somewhere, I have to find out what the X coordinate is. And you can find that out via the rulers. You know, if I need the rectangle to only be inside of the door, well, that's somewhere on 400. And then down somewhere around 250. So if I wanted my rectangle to start over to the right, 400, and then from the top, 250. So now I'm going to only be able to move this rock from around this area here. Start from around here to the right. Start from around here to the down. It's only movable around there. That might be better, but I'm going to set it up. Start from the top left. Let, let, let ourselves move it all over the place, on the roof, on the tree, wherever. A little bit smarter would be to define it in a logical area where to move it. So, out here, rectangle, uh, start X, start Y, end X, 
and y coordinates. Start on the top left, move to the bottom right of my whole stage. I can put numbers here, start 200 down, uh, 200 to the right, 200 down, and then only, only uh, 400, only 200 to the right and 200 more down. So only a certain space here, right? I can put 200. Start from the top left, but only allow to the right 200 units. Or here, we're starting from the, start from the top left and then only allow down 100 pixels. We need the rock to have an event listener. So a little copy and paste here. I'm going to copy the line of the tree. I need that line. We're going to need the we're going to need a function in a moment as well. But before that, I'm going to copy the, the line that's halfway written for me right there. Stay right there, change it to the instance name of the rock. And then we're going to change this function to accommodate. But I'm going to need this twice. Previously had touch tap. Tap at one time, do the thing. Now we're going to tap and hold. So we have touch begin. Start to pay attention when I tap and hold it, when I begin to touch the rock. What happens when I stop and let it go? That is a touch end. I'm going to listen for the moment of tapping and holding it, and then we're going to listen for the moment that we let it go. It's different. That's the ingredient for tapping and dragging something. The something, of course, is this instance name, which is the same as this. And then, well, what happens when we uh, tap it and hold it versus what happens when we let it go? Well, that's the function that's going to happen here. I wrote it, obviously, gibberish, but to show you that, yeah, we write this code the same way many times over and over, and we change a couple of things. The couple of things that are going to change is, okay, what's the name of my rock? What's my instance name? In my case, I called it front rock. So here is front rock, here is front rock. Listen for the beginning of tapping it and listen for the end of tapping it. There is a function that will run here about the rock. There is a function that will run here about the rock. When we start, move. Stop, move. Different group of code that will happen as we as we interact. But here, two event listeners, or when we begin to drag and end to drag as its own function, its own group of code when detected. When it detects that you start to drag it around and when you let go. So I'm going to start to drag it around. This is where it's going to then pay attention to how far do I drag it within the rectangle boundary. And then when I let it go, that's when I then need to write code to detect, is this rock touching this window? If it is, do something. If it's not, do something else. So then the definition of this function, I think we can copy and paste, but we'll maybe copy and paste a little bit here or write it manually. We're going to need this, this part here again. Little change. Part is important too, but we'll copy a part of it. 
uh, we need to define what is the definition of that code. So might as well grab that. Make sure to complete it. Of course, just to match this. Here's a little trick. I don't know if I've mentioned, if you double click a piece of code, it usually does a good job of selecting what you need. So instead of clicking and dragging and dragging wrong, you can double click that. That should be smart enough to select what you need. Double click. If you triple click, one, two, three, it selects the whole line. Little time saver there. Instead of trying to click and drag and you miss, you can triple click a line, one, two, three. It grabs the whole line so you can copy. A double click grabs the one thing you're clicking on. C copy or right click copy, double click that, paste. The feedback for ourselves. And I've got the start move and I have the stop move, which will be the same thing here. Okay, select that, paste it, change it, stop move, stop move, stop move, stop move. There's that repeti repetitive nature. For some people, that's nice. I have a logical mind. I have a detail-oriented mind. For other people, this is mind-numbing. When is the difference? It's so similar. It's uh, da, da. so different mentalities for coding. Whatever you have, you, you, you have it. But I like, I like the repetition sometimes. If you understand the basics and the logic of it, then you can logically repeat it. So again, there's a rock that is going to be listened for, touching begin, run some code. There's the code. There's going to be a rock that we pay attention when we stop dragging it, run some code. There's the code. It's not done yet, but I can test it so far, and I believe I can start to drag it so far. Actually, no, not yet. Um, yet, but we can still see the uh, output. Or thing. But if we go here and... I'm tapping and holding, and it's saying right there, moving is, is running. It's not going to move yet. But when I let it go, it detects that I let it go. Holding it, letting it go. It's not done yet, but it's detecting. Dragging begin, dragging end. Okay. So move the rock sprite or object around within the boundaries. That is event dot target dot start touch drag capital T capital D parentheses. First part here is basically the the thing that I'm currently holding on to start to drag it around the screen. This kind of means this. This thing that I'm interacting with, this is kind of another way to refer to it. Why this versus that? Actually, I'll make myself a note on that. I'll check it later. And use front rock. Stop. Don't worry about that, but I'll check that in a moment. But anyway, this thing that I'm currently holding on to, start to drag it around. We need a few more options here, just like we created a rectangle and made options. Okay, start to drag it how? Well, within, we're saying event dot, dot touch point ID. This is keeping track of the, um, this is keeping track of the coordinates. 
that we are that that our our finger is currently at touch point ID is keeping track of what coordinates on the screen we're at. Comma, uh, I forget what false is, but let's just type it. And then comma, uh, rock boundaries. Let's reposition the symbol, I believe. So we're saying there's, I'm holding on to something. Let's start to drag it. Every, uh, let's start to drag it based on the coordinates where my finger is at. False, I'll get back to that one in a moment, and stay within the boundaries. So that, it's not done yet, but I can test this moving around. Go so down there, it says you're moving it around. When I let it go, it detects you stopped moving it around. Explain the code in a moment. If you put true here, that does a slightly different thing that it resets the location of the object. It's very subtle. Uh, it may or may not matter to you, but might be useful. There's the difference. If we put true right there, if I grab the object, if I grab the rock from the little corner, I'm going to grab it from the corner. With true, it's going to snap into the center of my finger. If I, if I attach it with the corner, I'm going to keep holding it by the corner with false. If I put true, it's going to snap into the center of my finger. So watch this. If I tap it and hold it here, see it snaps into the center of my finger. If I let it go. I'm grabbing it from the corner, but then it snaps into my center of my hand. I may or may not want that. I'll put the notes there. You can choose which one you like. In my notes, I have false, but maybe I kind of like true, actually. But let's explain what does this code do. Um, start, touch, drag. What it's doing is um, X and Y of where my finger is, comma, uh, center the object or not, true or false, and then boundaries. Part of events, event target, as I said, I have a note right here, which I'll check later. But in short, this, this is referring to the thing I'm currently dragging. This chunk of code is referencing the coordinates where my finger are at. This is saying true, snap it into the center, get a good grip on it, false. False is just drag it from where you have it both give you the same end result, but visually they're slightly different. Sense of the object or not, true or false. And stay within coordinates. Well, I made coordinates up here. But boundaries that go from this to that, stay within these boundaries as I start to drag. Okay, the whole point of this is hit detection. If we can detect that this object is touching that object, then do something. Um, so we will detect if that rock is within the is within the, the same location as that other object. Obviously, at the moment, it doesn't know that we want that to happen. let it go, we want code to run and check. Is this object in the same area as that object? Yes, do something. No, do something else. Here's where we're gonna program some AI. We keep hearing about AI and all that good stuff. We're gonna create some AI right now, artificial intelligence. Um, the kind we will create, of course, is not on the level that we see in the news, but here we're, create, we're gonna make a little program, a uh, little bit of coding for the for anime to make a decision, to make a choice, to think. We have two choices. Either the rock is hitting the window or it's not. That's a decision. And that's a decision based on the person playing your game, depending where they've moved it. But now, when we stop moving the rock, make a decision. Think. 
is the rock touching the window or not? So jump over to your to your end here. Stop move, I mean, and then we can write the comment conditional statement. See, that's AI. Conditional statement to detect collision. If two objects are touching or not. All right, so where we've got, um, where we've got, uh, we're moving something around similar to up here where we had, uh, let's pay attention to when we move it, let's pay attention to when we stop moving it, and then as we're moving it around, drag it around on screen, something similar but the opposite. Uh, once we let it go, we need to do something similar. Um, so actually, before the conditional here. Sorry, before the conditional, then we'll do event target. We can copy and paste, but event target dot uh, stop touch drag. Stro parameters, oh yes, event touch point ID. Now we could have copied a bunch of stuff here. Copied all of that. And then you need to change to stop. So this line is very similar to the line 42, but notice it's stop versus start. And this one is uh, detect, uh, what's this doing again? Stop touch, um, stop. So detect, detect that we've stopped. Uh, this will guarantee that the, that the object doesn't slide around on the screen basically, uh, because as we're holding on to it, start to drag it as we let go, stop moving it around on screen. So it's gonna kind of snap in place a little easier. Uh, so confirm that that's a stop versus a start. Then we'll do the conditional statement, make a choice. Uh, and there's like four or five different conditional statements that we have in our tool belt. Um, one of them is called if else. This is making two choices. We can create code that makes 10 choices. Uh, we'll see some of those later. But right now, this is two possibilities. The rock is touching the window or not. If the rock is touching the window, do something. Or else it's not touching the window, do something else. If else, this is a conditional statement. It is written in a very specific way. The command if, parentheses, curly braces, beginning and end, else, beginning and end, Else, detection checker. Something is true, do something, or else it's false. Basically, all of this AI stuff, all of this thinking a computer does is just checking true or false. Computers are so advanced and amazing, but deep down, you might have heard that it's all binary. Maybe you might have heard that binary and that's basically everything a computer is basically zeros and ones we look at real words and icons and graphics and all of that in code but deep deep down on the computer every computer it's zeros and ones it's binary on the next level up it's uh, more human readable next level up more human readable to the level that it's an app but deep down everything is zeros and ones or true and false and so this AI is just going to check if something is true or false, zero or one. Zero is false and one is true, true and false. If it's true that the touch, that the rock touched the uh, window, break the window animation, or else it's false and therefore don't play the animation. Uh, we're going to break this apart into readability. I wrote it on one line but we're gonna break it for readability within the two curly braces here, here. So here, which I broke apart just for readability. 
say it's, we can say true section, false section. And we're starting with a very simple either or, if else. We can, of course, and we have other commands and other ways to make multiple decisions. We'll look at that later. We have two possibilities. Section trace rock touched the window. False section. It's about to make a decision. There's something to write here. Check, test something, check something. Either it will be true or false. Stop moving the rock. Stop moving it on screen. Make a decision. It will either be a true result that they touched or a false result that they didn't. So we can do just for the logic of it. One is the same as one. If one is the same as one, hey, that's true. Do this code or 1,000 lines. Is two exactly the same as one? That's false. Skip this part, do this part is one is a uh, is 11 greater than one that's true the number 11 is more than the number one that's true do this section ignore that section is 11 greater than 111 that's false skip this section do this section basic logic of ai is about true false and such we're being a little bit more complex here in that, is this rock touching that window? But it's still true or false. Does the rock equal the window? It's not the right code, but does the rock equal the window? Does the position of the rock equal the position of the window? True, it detected it, it's touching, do something. No, the rock is on the roof, not on the window. Else, false. That's what's happening in, those, in that parentheses. For our case here, we're not dealing with simple numbers. We're dealing with coordinates and other stuff. So we have since name of the rock, front rock. Since name of the rock, the command of dot hit test object, parentheses, Be careful here, it types it for you, but be careful here. We have an opening and closing parentheses as we often have, or as we have everywhere. And those two opening and closing parentheses are related to this command here. Also got a closing parenthesis that is related to this command here. If you've only got one parenthesis here, it looks like it, it looks like it's correct until you try to run it, you'll get an error. These parentheses here are only applying to this and now I've somehow I've accidentally deleted the parenthesis for the if command. Make sure you've got two right parentheses here, only one left parenthesis here because the other left one is over here. Got the rock, let's test if that object has hit the window. What's my window instance name? Uh, front window. Here, front window. Test that an object has hit that object. That object is going to be tested against that object. Do their, do any parts of their coordinates match? The rock is 50 pixels wide. The window is 20. And there's X and Y coordinates of it all. And there's some amount of size of the rock and some amount of size of the window. If any amount of that rock touches any amount of that window, that's a hit. If we need it to be exactly at a certain point, that's something else. But if any amount of the rock touches any amount of the window, that's a hit. That is a true. See, it's not done yet, but let's see. If I um, 
that. No errors, hopefully. No errors. And I interact. Dragging still works, of course, if I let it go. The rock didn't touch the window. Didn't touch the window. Didn't touch the window. Touch the window. Touch the window. Tell people you've written your first AI app. There. Conditional statement on the condition of something being true, do something versus false. This is just going to do the same thing we saw on the previous, on the, on the front door or on the tree. We will then play an animation of the window breaking. And then at the end of the animation of the window breaking, move us to the next scene. So the window has an instance name where we will play its timeline, which will have a breaking frames. When it gets to the end of those frames, the code to move to the next scene. Before we do that, make some notes here. So additional statement. So it makes sense enough, right? Uh, I guess I should say here, uh, the command dot hit test object. Object versus that object. Something tested against another object. If any of its if any of its pixels overlap, that's a hit. Say, uh, play the timeline of the window breaking, then move us to the next scene. We're out of scenes. We're going to make a new scene in a moment. The next scene after that, well, we're not at the end of the game yet, of course. We're going to get in the house. So we'll make a new scene in a moment. First hallway, whatever. But we'll move to, we'll move to a new scene. To scene, uh, we're going to go into a scene called hallway, main hall. Scene, hall, main. Doesn't exist yet, but we'll make it exist soon enough. Play the timeline of the window, then move us to the new scene of hall. Right, I need to edit the window to make a breaking animation and then the code to move us to the hall scene, which doesn't exist yet. Library, my window, click to edit it. Should know where this is going. A timeline will play by itself unless we stop it. So maybe the first thing I'll do here is I'll set up my stop on that first frame. Draw a few frames of a window breaking. It'll be the quick and dirty version of it breaking. I'll make the nice pretty version later. I'll put a sound on it too later. But um, wait, I'll do this. So again, I'll jump two frames at a time. Do uh, F7, I'll do a redraw each frame. That's too much effort, but I'll do it that way. Uh, I will make a blank keyframe and then I can see onion skin, my previous frame, so I can know where I'm drawing and I'll start to draw a breaking. The frame will kind of wiggle, I guess, and then I'll start to draw some cracks in the glass. So it's going to be normal. It's going to start to crack. Jump two more frames. F7. Turn on onion skin. Draw. It's 
would be more efficient to copy my previous lines and then add to them, I guess. We'll fix it later. Um, then that is going to start to break there, further crack out there. So next, Let's start to, uh, on this next drawing, it's the frame, but by now the glass is starting to jump out of the frame. Terrible glass there, but um, here, but uh, a couple more frames. Part of the window by now, the shards are down here. will be visible for some amount of time. This is just the same idea as the tree that uh, it's of course stopped at the beginning and then animates for some amount of time and then F5 keyframe if I add a regular frame and then it's like a pause, then the final frame on this one, I think it really does really, you really want to go to one second, possibly two seconds of pause to really see what happened. Maybe one and a half seconds. Um, you want the animation to happen, a little bit of pause, something happened, and then it'll automatically move. It's not that, okay, I've broken the window, then I'm going to walk in. We could do it that way, break the window, then click the window to walk in. We might as well do it the same way as the door where it, opens up and I walk in. I could do, of course, anything, but I want to do it. It's just, it breaks and I walk in. I walk in after a little bit of a pause. I walk in. Walking in is that on the final frame of animation, right? Click, insert, blank, keyframe on your code. Then I've got the code to move to the next scene. I'm going to copy that out of from, a, from another place that I've already done it. Uh, we, we did a move from screen to screen. Many times, move from screen to screen. I'll just grab it from somewhere that I know it works. You type it if you wish. But the point is that after the animation plays at the end, where whatever frame that may be, blank keyframe of code on the final frame of animation, paste it in there. Of course, we need to change it. We're going to move somewhere. We're going to move to a scene that doesn't exist yet. But that is hall main. Error if you try to run this code. We won't get an error as soon as I run the code. We'll get an error when I interact with that because then it runs that code. Um, but you see the logic that after the breaking happens, after a little pause in the timeline, then move us to the main hallway. So it pauses, then it'll move us. Uh, that scene doesn't exist yet. I've only got um, the scene, so I need a new scene. Scene, and so the order of these scenes doesn't matter where they're at, but I like them in a logical order. It doesn't matter if they're in whatever order. Uh, the most, the one that does matter is the first scene, but after that, the order doesn't matter. Um, this one, of course, scene, hall, main. I do logically like it to be in a good order, so I'll move it up. That scene 
just very simply here, whatever. And then code, of course, to stop us here. Or else things will go on its own and probably a trace here. You're at main hall. It's the details on the next class, of course. But now there's a scene. I've made a brand new scene. I've named it as my code expects. Obviously, they need to match. I can call these things whatever I want. Uh, I know we're going to go in different hallways in this house. As you make your own game, you can call these things whatever you want. Just keep track of them. At the end, doesn't matter. I want it logically in order. I'm going to add stop there. So if I run my code, I'll put it on the window, window breaks. I move there. I could, of course, polish things up. I broke the window. Why not take away the rock? Why not let it drop to the ground? Yes, all these possibilities. You saw the animation. It maybe happened too fast. Maybe slow it down a moment. There was a little bit of a pause after it all broke, and then we moved into the next spot. A lot of polish to do. You have to start it all over if you want to see it again. It's doing what I want. Hits detection of one object versus another. Or that. Um, just again to test it, uh, I I know that at the end of this animation I want to move, but for the moment I'll turn off, I'll turn off move just so I can see it, because obviously it's going to do it right away as soon as as soon as it the code is detected, but I want to turn it off for a moment just to see what it actually looks like. So if I start it, touch it. It breaks and again. I can still move that rock around, and then other weird stuff happens if I then fully move it around, and then it replays, which of course is not supposed to happen because I turned off the code, but I just wanted to see that all the stuff falling down, because you know it uh, falls down in a certain area that I couldn't see where it's falling because I was editing the symbol outside of context. As I said, I could set it up that break the window, the window's broken, the rock disappears, and then I click on the window to go in. Lots of things to do. I'm just setting it up, break the window, little pause, then I walk in. And I realize that rock is way too big. So I'm gonna resize the rock a little bit. I'm gonna reactivate. Notice this is not only good for making comments, this is good for deactivating your code temporarily. I need this to move there, but temporarily turning it off turning it into a comment and slightly lower and that rock feels a little large. So slightly smaller. To the hallway and it's a dead end at the moment needs more interaction needs an actual hallway drawn here but we're just about the end of the day so review of everything we did a lot today on one screen we did a whole lot right we have these various elements some of them are dead end elements or two of them are dead end elements and then one is a hit detection saying it like that well that's not too much to say but what did we do? We wrote dozens of lines of code today. Lots of comments, but dozens of lines of code, which of course I'll put up for review in a moment. But in this uh, front door scene, we've got all of these, in my case, around 60 lines of code plus comments where we had set up what we've learned before, listeners, and then playing timelines, listeners, and then turning off listeners. We're setting up boundaries so that we can move things. We're detecting drag and drop. As we drag, as our finger drags, we also drag the sprite around on screen. 
as we drop, uh, stop moving the object, the sprite, and then we do a little AI hit detection. If we see a hit, run some, run a timeline. If there is no hit, don't do anything, make a decision. Within these symbols, now we have code within some of these symbols so that the animation doesn't play on its own. And then when we trigger animation, reaching a certain point, do something. After this tree animates until it breaks, then stop paying attention to its interactivity. When this window animates and breaks at the end of the break, move us to a new screen, just like the gate. The gate does not play automatically until they interact. When it opens, move us to a new screen. Combining old and new concepts today, we'll keep doing that as we go on. As usual, this, will, this is all being recorded. This will all be uploaded to um, Canvas. And my uh, example code up to this point, you see mine works. I'm happy to put my example up on Canvas. You're, you're welcome to download a copy of it and reverse engineer it. You're welcome to take mine and change it. Obviously, don't turn in my code back to me when you do the assignment, when I give an assignment next week. But between now and then, you should be able to add all of what we've learned this week, Monday and Wednesday. You should be able to add all of this code to your project. And the way I would do that is, again, make sure that my version works and that you kind of understand it. And then on your version of the game, make your scenes code match my scenes code, my symbols code, and start adding my code to your project. Wrap up at this point. We'll do help and such. And... Um, Back next time with uh, more additions to the project.